welcome to the most excellent 80s movie podcast on the most excellent podcast network it's the podcast where a filmmaker and a comedian are the lone rogue defenders of the metaphorical nakatomi tower of 80s movies we love and the terrorists are both the haze of nostalgia we feel and the 2018 soon to be 2019 eyes we are using to revisit them and if that doesn't make any sense well yippee kayak mother buckets this is episode 25, Die Hard, a Christmas special? Question mark. <laughs> and movie selection from 1988. It's Christmas Eve in LA, California. Is Daddy coming home, Sue? Well, we'll see what Santa and Mommy can do, okay? A New York cop, John McLean, has come to see his wife. I missed you. Instead. Save her. Sit down. Within this skyscraper high above the city, 12 terrorists have declared war. They're about to be taught a lesson in the real use of power. There is brilliant because I am interested in the $640 million in your vault. As they are ruthless. But I'm telling you, you're just going to have to kill them. Okay. We do it the hard way. Now, the last thing McLean wants... Think, damn it, think! ...is to be a hero. Where's Howie? Hey, Tucker! Where? But he doesn't have a choice. What does he think he's doing? <laughs> John. They have already killed one hostage. This channel is reserved for emergency calls only. Hey, you I sound like I'm one of the pieces! He's inside? Who is he? getting longer and longer and longer <laughs> like this one's really long it, yeah it it, uh, it really felt like they were kind of pushing like a beverly hills cop fun angle on this one where the explosion is the bad words he says uh, like they get all the way up to the and, bad and words and then like, explosion just the upbeat music hi guys well welcome to the party pal that's of course nathan blackwell of squishy studios oh hi there what wait hang on who's that over there is that <laughs> chrissy lens of national comedy theater i got invited to the party by mistake oh who knew all right so we, we kind of like realized that we should do maybe a christmas special <laughs> Again, question mark. Um, we're so confident about this. <laughs> we're just, so we're like, what What should we do? Well, we got to do Die Hard, right? Because it's a Christmas movie? We're, sure. we're, we're, <laughs> it's, there's a debate and we've chosen our sides. We need not go into it too much. Okay. Well, um, the truth is, is that, I mean, even the trailer is super Christmassy, but I mean, there's no christmasness to the actual structure of the movie it's just really a backdrop it's really just a setting yeah, yeah. you know but so it's like i did a so i sometimes uh, do a morning show here in arizona called your life arizona um and i appear as the guru of geekery and so on last channel? year on channel three um i did a holiday party holiday movie party Mm -hmm. segment um and i actually built a 
and with the premise that Die Hard is a Christmas movie, um, <laughs> built a gingerbread Nakatomi Tower and had a build your own John McClane in the, um, which you can actually see on my Christmas tree. Oh, um, hey. John McClane in the air vent Christmas ornament. Oh, yeah, yeah. You could, you, it's like foil and paper and you yeah. make your own. Um, and we had a Yippie cocktail for your Die Hard Christmas party, so. I do think it's a Christmas movie, but I don't think it's only a Christmas movie. Like, you can watch it any time. Yeah. Permission granted. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Unlike Gremlins, which is, like, squarely a Christmas movie, I feel. It's weird, yeah, because I feel like it, with Gremlins, like, you, I don't remember that until I watch it. You that know? it's like, all about it, Christmas? Yeah, like, it's it, it seems like the, the Christmas party and all that other stuff is a lot more on the surface for me mm-hmm. just maybe i know die hard more better um you know than gremlins like when i think of gremlins i think of the gremlins and i think yeah of, like the horror aspect. gremlin in a microwave yeah that sort of yeah, thing i forget that has it have you watched gremlins in a while it's been a while okay we'll have to save that for another episode <laughs> but i hate gremlins um, <laughs> uh okay so what is your history with this movie um, so, uh, let's see, um, in 88, I was 12, so not really the right age to go see it in the theater. I think that might be the perfect age to go see it. <laughs> but yeah, so probably at age 13, as soon <laughs> as my, it came on HBO, I w- I'd probably go to my friends and watch it, mm-hmm. or, I don't think we ever rented it, and I think eventually, because it was such a popular movie, it came out on TV a bunch of times as kind of like the the TV safe version of it. You yeah. Know? Um, but this is one of those one this is one of those movies I didn't have access to, but I still I felt like I saw it like a dozen times. Yeah, me too. I definitely it was a household favorite, and like yeah, either either we had a videotape that we recorded off of TV of that TV safe version, or Sometimes my dad, who had a video editing business in the 90s uh, and late 80s, would edit movies like this and take out the bad language. And if there was boobs and sex and stuff, Uh would just take those things out. And so we watched this movie all the time, the TV safe and or Ken Stewart edited version. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know there was a sex scene in Top Gun until I was an adult. (laughs) I just thought it went straight from volleyball to the the next day. Just a nice Uh, romance between men. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, But this is definitely a a, a family favorite, a favorite of mine, um, and a movie I have seen bagillions of times. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. This was like... You know, we talk about like as you as a kid, you're programming your mind by watching these stories over and over again. And this is a hundred percent one of those movies for me. Like, it was like action movie structure, action movie minions, and and like you know cat and mouse games between the hero and villain. Like it was like super strategy, and like and then also like the hero just going through this gauntlet, like being a being a vulnerable human. And being hurt and having difficulties and really just getting just kind of like um, squeezed through the grinder, you know. And at the end of the movie, he, he just wants to collapse. Yeah. Um, I think I really responded to that, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a, little, a template yeah. almost. And strangely enough, probably not so much like... It's a template, Nathan, it's a, a tem- template. <laughs> I'm going to make a, a runaway That's, reference uh-huh. in every episode we do. Okay, let me write that down. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry I interrupted you with my No, no, no. runaway joke. Yeah. Um yeah, this is this is 100% a movie that I loved as as when I was a a young lad and then also an old lad. Yes. <laughs> um did you know this was based on a book? Yes. That's part one of my question. Part two of my question is, has your brother Logan read the book? <laughs> <laughs> no. But I, I've met... So there's two screenwriters for this, and I've met one of them. He was at um, um, the Phoenix Film Festival or Phoenix Film Festival Foundation event. Okay. Um, and so he was, I, I believe, the original screenwriter. 
and then it, it it's unfortunate. This is the way that it usually happens: is that there's multiple names. They they don't ever. It's not like they work together. Like when you right. see other screenwriters, unless the, there's that little and ampersand that means they're like a, a team, mm-hmm. a screenwriting team. Uh, and so usually what happens is one screenwriter will come in, do a couple of drafts, and then they'll just bring in another screenwriter to add a different flavor or take. But basically, one person is fired. Not they may not even <laughs> know until it's well after the fact. They're basically just replaced. They're not so much yeah. fired. Um, and so I m- met the first screenwriter and and just kind of like the stuff that he put in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's 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 really interesting and it's definitely one, it's it's such a tightly constructed movie. It's kind of like Casablanca. Do we use like this is perfect? Like all these different aspects all coordinated. And when you hear the real story about how it was made, some of the stuff is they just made up on the day, like yeah, you know. And, and it's it's a marvel because it's it's like a clock. It's so well put together, so well directed by John McTiernan. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's great. It does have the feel though, in the in the same way that like Speed kind of has the feel of like an action movie writer wrote an action movie and then maybe they had a comedy writer come in mm-hmm. and take a pass and like add jokes. Mm-hmm. Cause in speed, Joss Whedon actually like did mm. the final pass and like made it more comedic Yeah, and added those lighthearted moments. So like, and I don't know that it seemed like it's possible that they were like, let's add some, let's lighten it up. Let's add a little bit of humor. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you said, <laughs> So the the scene, which is actually one of my favorite scenes, and I think it's one of the best scenes, where um, Hans Gruber bumps into John McClane in the hall. Oh, yeah. And uh, pretends to be an American. They made that up on the spot. Clay. Bill Clay. Bill Clay. Because they were like, oh, did you... Alan Rickman can just... He can do a pretty good American accent. Should we add a scene where he pretends... And they did. And that's like my favorite part. Uh, yeah, it's so good. There's so many great moments. It's funny. It's like most of like the and, it, and it's really it's really funny too. Yeah. And and honestly, like most of this most of the the funniness, I I'm, I'm it's not really Bruce Willis. Mm-hmm. It's it's all the other stuff like the two Johnsons and sometimes the thugs are doing ridiculous stuff. Like I love the moment to where they're 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 waiting for the police to in to break into the building to attempt mm-hmm. to go and break in the SWAT team, and then uh, one of the the thugs is waiting there at the candy counter, and he has a, a moment and he looks at the candy and decides to take a can- steal yeah. a candy bar, <laughs> and then as like the and then as the SWAT team is moving into position, one guy is cutting through a, a rose garden and he he ow 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 he gets pricked <laughs> by the roses. Yeah, there there is a lot in this movie. There's so much that's really good. You know, the worst character ever in a movie that is just so easy to hate, the like Ellis the 80s oh, yeah. sneeze machine. Th- there this this is a masterclass in um kind of like small supporting characters. Mm-hmm. You know, Oh, absolutely. And I find that um that this is so this is this is a my deep cut recommendation too, but this is also like uh, John, I see like John McTiernan do this in The Hunt for Red October as well. Mm-hmm. Um, just everyone has a unique personality, a unique look, a unique take, and there might be two dozen characters, and everyone kind of has a moment to pop. And and that's one of the things I. This is a great m- movie to study for that, for making all your ensemble, all all the different characters in your world, interesting and unique. And you know, it's like there's so many thugs. There's there's like a dozen of them, and then each of them has has kind of each of them has their own look and their their own kind of unique personality. Like you've got the you've got like pseudo Huey Lewis. Yes, <laughs> and then you've got like the, um, you've got like the two German brothers, mm-hmm. and then you've got Marco, like the sassy Italian Spanish guy. Mm-hmm. You you know just shoot if you if you're going to kill someone, just do it. Yes, <laughs> um, and, and and then so on and so forth, and then even when it comes down to the you know you could easily just have one cop 
mm-hmm. who is in charge of this. But you've got um, our main cop, um, you Reginald Val Johnson, Cap- Captain Captain Family Matters. Yes, um, and then and then he and then you and then you have. Um, the teacher from the Breakfast Club come in. Yes, and and first he's a hard ass, and then he kind of switches into the comedic role, the buffoon, the buffoon as the FBI guys come in, and they're both named Johnson, no relation, but they both also have like very distinct personalities. Yeah, each of them, even though they've got the exact same name, and so um, yeah, and it just keeps going on and Argyle, on. like yeah, even. Though he gets killed like almost immediately, you you feel like a connection to Takagi, yeah, and the pregnant assistant who I don't think says more than two lines, mm-hmm. um, yeah, definitely very well said. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Each of these characters is it. I mean, the, we barely know uh, Takagi. He, yeah, he's the boss, uh, but we get these little bits of him as Alan Rickman is is listing off like his resume. And we're like, oh, shoot, like we, we kind of understand like who he is, like he's an overachiever. He was in an internment camp. You know, he, he even though he was born in Japan, in Kyoto, mm-hmm. he's basically an American, spent all of his life here. And he, he, he got to this position by merit. And so immediately when he's put into danger, we like him. Yep. You know, uh, even though he, he's kind of a... A plot. And he's, he's it, also it, really kind to John McClane. Like we find out yeah. that's why the limo picked him up, and he's like any any husband of uh, Miss Gennaro, you know? Right. And and then 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 you've got Miss Gennaro, his wife, mm-hmm. you know, who she's using her her maiden name. Take that patriarchy. <laughs> and she is like the she's like second in charge. Yep. Yeah, she's the boss. Mm-hmm. And there's never any kind of double take or whatever. It's just fact. Yep. Even there, well, I'll tell you who's double taken on it. John McClane, <laughs> who ain't cool with his lady bringing home the butter. That's not yeah, right. Right. Bacon? Look, she brings home butter and bacon. That's you how good she is. You can't bring each of those home every day. You've got to <laughs> alternate. Wednesday is bacon. Tuesday is butter. Yeah. Um, but so there's something that I think... There's these sort of conventions in 80s movies, not exclusive to 80s movies, but things that only happen in movies that aren't real, as far as I know, ever. Like, movies that are about high school reunions always take place in the school cafeteria or gym, right? Mm -hmm. They're always at the school. Nobody ever has their reunion at their school. (laughs) That doesn't happen. They're always at some, like shitty banquet hall (laughs) it's never at your high school the same is true for this i think nobody has a company christmas party on christmas eve Mm -hmm. you can't that's not how christmas works so if if we're going down the route of of um, logic here i've got a couple of action movie gripes okay i would love to hear that that this movie is not exclusively to blame for, but it does populate these throughout. All right, so full auto on a like a machine gun, like you know, so it's it's shocking how quickly you run out of bullets if you if everyone was everyone was shooting. There's so much ammo fired in this in this movie. It's awesome though. Also, I'm not critiquing it. I'm just pointing out these tropes. But yes. I mean. Like, you would run out of your entire clip of bullets going full auto, like, in seconds. Mm-hmm. And then it's gone. Like, it's it, goes, gone. it goes so quick. It goes so quick. Um, um, and also, like, I'm not sure that he is, like, handling his gun in, an, in a, a police officer appropriate way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, he's, he's like... He sh- it should be pointed up or down. Like, and right. he's there's, just got There's it. no gun safety. Yes. Okay. Okay. Again... Yeah. I don't care. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm. I'm not full mad disclosure. About it. None of these things really upset me. I'm just pointing no. them out because I'm a smart ass. It's worth pointing right. out. Silencers. Hey, we're here to be smart so, asses. So uh, I've probably seen like three movies in a row where silencers are like the ultimate ninja weapon of modern day bad guys. Silencers yeah. really don't work that way. They're they're actually not significantly quieter they're suppressors yeah like, they're suppressors yeah. It, it's supposed to like soften the noise so mm-hmm. you you, it's, you have trouble where it is if you're in a confined space and you shoot a silencer that's what i just saw mission impossible 
Yeah. Um, and if love, you, if you're in a normal them. room, um, a gun with a suppressor is going to sound almost pretty much as loud as a normal gun. It's going to be super loud. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I feel like such a jackass. And then... Um, and that's, then... that's what we're here for. Nate. It's <laughs> what we're here for. Can I point one out? This is something that's happened in at least three of the movies that we've seen so far. Go for it. Um, the, the only one I can specifically remember is Three Men and Baby. But, like, people describing basketball to other people. <laughs> what the hell is that, 1980s? <laughs> people describing Was basketball. Was the breakout sports? I guess, but like nobody, let's not watch it. Let's just one person gets to watch it and then we'll all describe it to each other. Right. And then uh, the last one, the last action movie hero trope is, is when you raise a gun, it makes a cocking sound. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's because you just need that little, that little like amp up, you know, you need a sound effect to sell it. Um, I w- want to talk about how good Hans Gruber's dialogue is oh, Alan Rickman I mean, is so good in this Alan movie. Alan Rickman is so good in this movie, but like some of the things he says uh I could talk about industrialization and men's fashion all day, but I'm afraid business must intrude. Like, uh, oh my god, I'm in love with you. Like he is literally I'm in love with you. This is literally in the top 5 villains as far as I'm concerned of oh, all time. Has to be. And yeah. and what does he say? Like at the very end he's he she says, "You're nothing but a common thief." And he says, "I'm an exceptional thief." Mrs. McLean, like, it's like, yeah, he is. Shut up, Holly. <laughs> anyway, his dialogue is so good. Of course, of course, Bruce Willis is, is too. Like, the do I sound like a mortar and pizza? All of the like bust off little lines he's mm-hmm. he's got are so so great. But like, the dialogue is good. The mm-hmm. story is good. Oh yeah, it makes sense. Yes. Am I wrong? Like I all think movies are sense. ridiculous. It totally makes sense as a movie. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, like like we're saying, this movie is like structurally, it's like a clock. Yeah, yeah, it's like a Swiss clock. There's mm-hmm. there's very little uh, that just does not work. It's just all going, and it's perfectly timed. Yes, and including like having him take his shoes off. Oh yeah, at for the beginning the- of the movie is so. When you, it makes perfect sense. And then you watch it, you're like, oh my God, that is so shoehorned in to get his shoes off. Look at all the mm-hmm. work they went to to get his shoes off, but you don't notice it. It's, it makes perfect sense when you're watching it. And then you're like, wait, was that all just to get his shoes off? Mm-hmm. And the answer is yes. Uh, but yeah, like, so you mentioned that the principal from Breakfast Club is in this movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, but also Vigo the Carpathian from Ghostbusters 2 is uh-huh. one of the bad guys. Uh-huh. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the guy who cuts the power is the guy from the Burps. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. So this is like an 80s movie who's who. It's so good. It's such a great ensemble. Also, it, like, I will say that... This movie is more diverse than almost any of the other movies that we've watched, mm-hmm. with with maybe a couple of exceptions. Like, there's more people of color and, you know, not just white, 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 white. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I mean, um, this was something you did not see in the time as seeing an African-American, like, Ivy League computer hacker. You know, that's their hacker, you know? And there's not just one token black guy in the movie yep the fbi agent like there's you know argyle and uh the the original bell johnson like Mm -hmm. you know the movie's not great to or for women but you can't like completely put it in the bucket of like tone deaf 80s movies um the shoot the glass moment is so so I I, Brilliant. I love the way that like John McTiernan handles like language in movies because I've seen this in The Hunt for Red October and I think um, what's the one with Antonio Banderas the Last Warrior what's it the Thirteenth Warrior I have not seen that I don't know <laughs> what so that is. so it, it, uh, he makes it a thing rather than just like you everyone all russians must talk english you know okay there there's like a concept in in understanding the language like when so when they're they're in the big shootout hans gruber realizes that he's got bare feet mm-hmm. and he turns to the dude and says in german shoot the glass and mm-hmm. it's not subtitled and the guy is just kind of like huh <laughs> like and there's what? this pause and then ugh, 
and then he says it in English. Yeah. Because he's got a, a, a diverse ca- Shoot crew. Shoot the glass. Yeah. So so he first tells him in German. Mm-hmm. He doesn't get it. Tells him in English. So he makes it a moment rather than, oh, yeah, he's just going to tell him in English. Yeah. Like in, in The Hunt for Red October, they're speaking Russian, and he does this great push in into the guy's – uh, the guy who's talking into his mouth and then he and then it stops on his mouth and he starts speaking English and it pulls back out you and you a hundred percent understand what the filmmaker just did yeah i I really love that moment too but like so when were they gonna have if they just inserted that scene of Hans and John McLean in the hall that's when he notices that he's not wearing shoes mm-hmm. so I wonder when it happened in earlier versions of the story. Mm-hmm. Or if they were just like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if he wasn't wearing shoes? What if he wasn't wearing shoes this whole time? Right, right. No, I, I bet that that was, that was figured out pretty early on. I, yeah. It, it, we talked about things that don't make sense, but like mm-hmm. also that's not how gravity works. When he, so at that scene where he jumps out of the building with the fire oh. hose tied around himself and then like it's slowly dragging him backwards out the window. <laughs> that's not how that works. <laughs> That's not how the pull of the earth brings right. things down to it. Um, but, like, it's so good. Like, it's like, even those things that are completely ridiculous, you mm-hmm. don't, I don't, I don't care. Like, no, I no, completely it's forgive like, them. Yeah, I, I, I totally buy in that one yes. brick of C4 blows out an entire floor on a, on a building. Yes. One, and then, and then, but it's like also brilliant how John is like, but wait a minute, I blew up the C4. Why do you still want the detonators? Bum, 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 bum. Like something else is going on here. I do think also like I'm, a, I, have, I feel like now I'm really tired of the trope. Like I'm sure in 1988 it was still pretty fresh, but like I am now like really tired of the trope of like people don't believe the guy the who's like, yeah. he's telling them over and over again, like, I'm at Nakatomi Tower. You need to come. There are terrorists. And they're like, would you please stop? And it's like, what? what? You're not getting like a million yeah, prank it, calls. It, it feels, yeah. This it, is an emergency channel, sir. Like, it, it, what is wrong with you? Yeah, you feel like you're being prodded with like, oh, you know, just off the shelf conflict. It's yeah. kind of like. Oh, why are you making me so frustrated? Yeah. Yeah. We're not going to... Like, it takes eight people not believing him. And then even once they're there and they know there are terrorists there, even still they're like, well, you just get out of here, buddy. And he's like, oh, actually, like, I'm solving this problem, so maybe back off? But they're like, no, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. So I'm tired of it now. I'm sure then it was fine. Um, <laughs> I'm sure then it was seemed very, very fresh. And everyone is mad when it turns out to to be a robbery and not terrorism. Uh-huh. But like $640 million. In 1988 money. Is plenty to steal. Like, <laughs> like it's uh-huh. a really big big robbery yeah it's not a not it's an exceptional robbery it is so like everybody just get off their back pretending to be terrorists was genius Uh and i love that the part where he's like i just read about all those terrorist groups in time magazine yeah that was a great yeah that's a great touch it is and you wouldn't have that in a typical action movie the 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 great thing about this is not only is it so well constructed not only are does it have the premise of like you're trapped in a building, you're trapped like in the fort, and you, it, yep. you and and the bad guys are in there, and you've got to kind of like fight them off. Um, but it's got so much charm. Yes, and it, you know, and and a lot of it is that it is so well written, not just in terms of action and in terms of the clockwork like nature of the plot advancing, but also. I mean, the, you know, like the part where he's like, tell my wife she's heard me say I love you a thousand times, but she's never heard me say I'm sorry. That could be in love, actually. Like, that's <laughs> so good. Like, uh-huh. she's heard me say I love you a thousand times, but she's never heard me say I'm sorry. I'm like, John McClane, how do you have such depth? <laughs> um, but also I want to talk about Bruce Willis's dad bod. Like uh-huh. I, this is this is my sticky wicket. I realize I bring this up all the time, but like he is fit, 
but he's not he's 1980s fit oh yeah which is like Back all you day, needed was a little bit of definition in your biceps yeah all you needed to be is actually strong and healthy yes <laughs> you did not need to be like carved out of marble yeah you didn't need to have zero percent body fat and an 18 pack <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I heard a, a, a funny thing it's like um so tom cruise has like like zero percent body fat and apparently he's always cold because there's no <laughs> Poor Tom Cruise. Because I mean, you're not supposed to have that little body fat. Somebody get Tom Cruise a sweater. Yeah, yeah. Bruce Willis doesn't have that problem. No, nope. no, he's fine. Yeah, it's. I do think it's fun to kind of look back because when we're going to talk about who we would cast in in a reboot, like they're never mm. going to do a reboot, but yeah, yeah. Um, if they were going to, that person would not be wearing a wife beater. They would be shirt off. No shirt, no shoes, all service. Um, and they will be, <laughs> they will be like chiseled out of out of stone. Um, worth talking about, I always feel. Mm-hmm. Um, I also want to talk about before we sort of get into more of the um, data driven stuff. Like, I want to talk about the watch being the significant moment at the end. So, mm-hmm. so basically, Ellis, the 80s sleaze machine decides (laughs) that he's gonna try and like broker deal he's so he's like coked out of his mind Uh and he's like so good hans bubby no it's not him it's the reporter it's the sleazy reporter oh my god we we... it's the dean from who's from real genius yeah he i forgot about i completely forgot about that like C story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a sleaze bag reporter who goes to their home to interview the children on Christmas Eve when their parents are in a hostage situation. Mega sleaze. And that, like, because uh, uh, Holly Gennaro reacts to it, Hans Gruber's like, what? I'm going to look under this picture. Well, there's John McClane. It's lucky I met him in the hallway. I've put this all together now. Uh, He takes Holly hostage and... At the moment that John McClane has the gun taped to his back, which is brilliant, mm-hmm. uh, in the they're they're still high up, but they're in like a parking garage ish area. But they're still high up. They're still up in the building. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the, he goes crashing down, so he's falling. But as he's going over, he grabs and sort of slides down Holly's arm. Yeah. And then he's clinging to her watch and her watch is significant because we are told very early um that it is a rolex sleaze machine ellis tells us that it's a rolex show them your watch uh it was a gift to her from takagi for being so good at her job and successful uh, and like this watch is what he's Hans is grabbing onto, so M- John McLean has to unbuckle it and let it fall in order to defeat Hans Gruber. And I'm just wondering what we think that means <laughs> in terms of like the symbol of her success uh-huh. and her independence from him, and you know the thing that sort of. Well, not really. John McClane is the thing that drove a wedge into their marriage. But, like, in his mind, he's so resentful of her success that that's the thing that's, like, almost dragging her down and going to kill her at the end. I don't know. Do we have thoughts on that? Honestly, like, from a filmmaker point of view, they probably were thinking less about the meaning and more about, like, we need kind of, like, a, a thing at the end. We need, like, some kind of gag or whatever. Like, he can't just fall out. He's got to grab her. Well, what can he grab? Oh, the the watch. What if we give her a watch? How do we add significance to the watch? I mean, it's po- I mean, you one does try to add as much significance and meaning as you can. But my guess is Bruce Willis is already kind of set up as the one on the wrong side of this debate. Okay. I feel. I um, agree. I don't disagree. Yeah, and so. I think he's being a super, super dick, and he knows it, and yeah. everybody knows it. Yeah, and, and basically, yeah, and everyone knows it. So in terms of, like, um, the watch representing, like, her, any kind of negative in terms of, like, her success, and he's got to, like, dismantle it or anything like that, I I don't feel like that that is intentional. Okay. 
Um, because we also yeah, get the I jump scare think, with Fritz at the end. Yeah, Did you, and I forgot I, the jump yeah. scare with Fritz at the end. Yeah, exactly. Reginald Vell Johnson kills him, and it's like, oh, Carl Winslow, he got his um, gun arm back or whatever. Yeah, I, yeah. I feel like they just needed one more thing of tension. Yep. To juice the the villain's death, and it's such an awesome villain's death too. It is. It's yeah, so good. It's, it's two amazing shots back to back. Like normally you'd just have the guy fall. Mm-hmm. And so what they had instead is you see Alan Rickman fall like close up uh-huh. and they shot it like 270 frames per second. So it's literally him falling backwards like 10 feet onto like a blue screen giant pillow Mm -hmm. that they put the the city out on but you literally see him slowly fall away and and that terror is probably the real terror of being dropped of poor alan rickman (laughs) being dropped you know and and not seeing where he's gonna land Mm -hmm. and it's such an amazing shot and then you've got this huge stunt of this guy falling down a, a skyscraper like yeah Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of floors. Like he's going and going and going. And yeah. then you see everybody like, ooh. Like yeah. Kind of, ooh. ooh. Yeah. He's not okay. Yeah, people in the cheap seats are going, ah, there's something in my <laughs> eye. Is it Gruber? <laughs> um, okay, and then I also wanted to ask you, because we talked um, a little bit about, when we were doing the RoboCop episode, we talked a little bit about like Snake Plissken as sort of like, um, I think you used the term man's man, right? But he's mm-hmm. like the Clint Eastwood sort of yeah. silent type or whatever. And like John McClane is not that. No, no. And so like for me, like I know that Snake Plissken is like a really sticky, significant character for you. But I think I like John McClane more mm. because he is sarcastic and funny and makes pop culture references. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know what your thoughts were on that well he he's definitely more human uh for yeah. sure um and I, I, there's a certain part of him it, it's interesting it's like with like snake plissken he's kind of like an, an old west rebel right and his flaws are not there's not a spotlight put on it like mm-hmm. he is what it is and there's you don't say it's good. What flaw? I'm not sure. Bad. Flaws. I'm <laughs> right. Not, he, he he doesn't make I'm a lot of human some... connections. <laughs> um. Uh, and, and then with um, John McClane, mm-hmm. a lot of people kind of see him as a bit of a dinosaur or yeah. like a like a caveman. Yeah. You know, he's kind of like an old New York cop, or like a Philly style. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, dude, yeah, Palooka or whatever. I'm probably not using that word right, but <laughs> but he's just like a he's like a dude, and he rubs people the wrong way, and he sees this, and and they're like, "Why are you being such a caveman?" Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. And part of it is done to kind of like, oh, New York versus L.A. But he also Ugh. realizes that there's the grossest moment where he's in the airport and he's like, just. Ugh. gawking at this woman in like a very cliche 80s like um white skin tight thing who like jumps up on her boy and he's Pants, like yeah. california it's like oh my god you're gross yeah yeah and it's all him too yeah yeah it is okay so speaking of him if you were going to cast a reboot remake mm-hmm. Just in our own minds, who right. would you who would you cast? Okay, so so I I <laughs> so I actually thought about this. So I've got a kind of a different angle on this. Like, if I had it's to, all women, yeah, no, <laughs> um, it can be sure. Um, but uh, yeah, no, my my idea is um, is if you had to to remake Die Hard, mm-hmm. um. So he, okay, so here's the premise. So, so Logan kills, right? And then exactly. He has so to remake. so yeah, exactly. If you had to had to remake Die Hard, or if you had to do a pitch on it, and and if if it was a little more of a comedy, mm-hmm. this is how I'd pitch it. Is that first of all, I love that. First of all, okay, so Die Hard in this world, the movie exists. Okay. Okay, and so the villain wants to do something showy, and he wants to pull off. Or she, the heist from Die Hard, okay. and so in this case, 
the Nakit- Nakatomi Plaza, Plaza mm-hmm. is the building that they film the movie in. Mm-hmm. And so they're doing an actual heist, all, recreating some of the stuff from Die Hard in that. And then you have the actual Christmas party that's happening there. And you've got like two, you've got like maybe like it, like the two 21 Jump Street dudes mm-hmm. or like even like Will Ferrell, like, holy shit, this is Die Hard. And so they're legitimately in the situation that the characters were, but they 100% are meta aware of the movie Die Hard. Okay, can I tell you something? Yes. That exists. What? In 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 two episodes of Brooklyn Nine Nine, what? Which I can't. It can't be my deep cut recommendation because it's my deep cut re- recommendation for RoboCop. So I can't do the same thing two in a row. Okay, so Brooklyn Nine Nine, um, one of the uh, the main character who is Andy Samberg's character is obsessed with Die Hard. It's his favorite movie. His wedding cake is Nakatomi Tower <laughs> wedding cake. Um, <laughs> but they do an episode where uh, one of the plot points is that they drive past the building that is Nakatomi Tower and they go in and he's like take my picture with it this is not na- this is the building and then they also do an episode where they are in a hostage situation and they have to do die hard so he's like skulking around writing the terrorist names and taping stuff to his back and um the joke is that everybody's seen die hard and they're mm-hmm. like yeah we know what you're gonna do you're doing Die Hard. Right. And that's where the yippee kayak mother buckets comes in because <laughs> that's what he thinks it is. Um, so I love that idea and I think it's great. And it's like, it's not exactly like what the Brooklyn Nine-Nine right. did. Right. They Brooklyn don't go Nine-Nine far is. enough, they I don't. think. And they've only got half an hour, so yeah. they do their best. Real people would be dying in my version. Okay. okay. And, and who would you cast? Will Ferrell? Do you have a Hans Gruber? No. I do, but yeah, but what I was I was definitely kind of thinking along the lines of kind of like the the Twenty One Jump Street style of humor, where it's like I like that. two dudes egging each other on, both wanting to be John McClane. Yeah, both wanting to be John. Yeah, and then the, like the they argument. maybe even argue over like, no, I'm John McClane. No, yeah. you're not. You're and not then John then you also McClane. have someone else to freak out about that you just you just shot a dude. You know, you yeah. just shot someone. <laughs> I love it. I like that. Um, okay, so I went more like literal. Like, who would I? Who would? I, who do I see in these roles now? Mm-hmm. Um, I and I think the only person who could um, possibly take on the Hans Gruber role would be Benedict Cumberbatch, mm-hmm. which may be an obvious choice, but right, I think right. he'd be a great bad guy in a similar way. Um, and then for the John McLean part, well, okay, so I think for the Reginald Vell Johnson role the cop mm-hmm. carl winslow i think it would be funny to cast jaleel white hmm. who is urkel just <laughs> as like a and then for the john mclean part uh i think jensen ackles jensen ackles who is dean winchester in supernatural oh no um or dan stevens no Okay, what about the guy who plays Hopper in Stranger Things? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, it I, has to be someone who seems slightly tired. <laughs> like, yeah. Like I, I, well, I, like, li- I like doubling down on, on the, the kind of like New York cop, like out of his element. Mm-hmm. Kind of, re- I mean, not a lot of people are out of place in, in California. Mm. And he's he'd definitely be that. You need someone who's kind of resistant to that stuff maybe timothy olyphant uh he's kind of too cool too cool but he would be he would be great definitely if you went the more comedy route yeah yeah Hmm. all right so i'd put him in my version okay yeah he'd be great yeah he doesn't do enough comedy anymore now that he's got all his abs right he's not doing as much comedy as he should be um oh so nakatomi tower is the headquarters of 20th century fox (laughs) <laughs> and they paid themselves to shoot the movie there. <laughs> Genius. Which I'm pretty sure is not legal. <laughs> um, oh. uh, other fun facts. Uh, Bruce Willis got paid at the, at this time in 1988 the most anyone had ever been paid for a movie. Do you wanna, really? You want to guess how much it was? How much? Five million. What? I know, right? <laughs> uh-huh. <gasps> I'm pretty sure everybody gets it. I, th- he, I think they get that much just... on Big Bang Theory per episode. Right. He This was his breakout role, though. I mean, he was in other stuff. Yeah. He was in Moonlighting. 
And he, he had done some movies, right? But nothing have really. We, have we done a Bruce Willis movie yet? Audience, please write in. Have yes, we? We've done 25 I episodes. Don't think have so. we talked about Bruce Willis? No, you know why? Because when we, I, because I'm remembering we talked about Moonlighting, but we talked about Moonlighting because of the Robert Downey Jr. movie that has the woman. Sybil Shepherd. Thank you. I could not think of her name. Okay. Um. So box office wise, uh, this movie came in seventh. Not bad. Mm-hmm. The only other movie that yeah. we've done from 1988. We, we have really neglected 1988, uh-huh. Nathan. we got to do something. Uh, <laughs> it, Young Guns came in number 22. Die People Hard love was, that movie. Die People Hard was beat out just by one by Crocodile Dundee 2. That's right. Crocodile Dundee 2. <sighs> That's correct. And then uh, Twins was number five. Uh-huh. Big is number four. Coming to America is number three. Who Framed Audrey Rabbit is number two. And Rain Man was the number one movie yeah. at the box office. Mr. One Percent Body Fat, Who Needs a Sweater. <laughs> Tom Cruise in Rain Man. Um, okay, what is your... Or let's do a rating first. How okay, many... well, well, first, I've got something. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> there's so many cool diehard minions in this, like bad guys. Yeah. And they're all different. What are your top three diehard minions? <gasps> okay, number one has got to be, and I i won't know all of their names, but the computer hacker guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's so uh, cool. Theo. He is the one who, he's like, he's just cool. Yeah. He's snappy. He's fun. He's not at all feeling any of the gravity of nope. like, people getting their lives taken. Nope. Yeah. He's like, he's like a beyond it all. Yeah. And he's the one who describes basketball. So he's my favorite. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think you have to go Jump Scare Fritz. (laughs) Uh Who's just so mad at everyone the whole time. Right, right. From Witness. Yeah. And he, so he, he, he's the one who has the brother and his brother is probably my third favorite glasses. Mr. Huey Lewis guy. Oh, the, the, no, I'm saying Mr. Huey Lewis. I'm the guy with a slight little twang who lives until the very end. Oh, or you're right. Or get shot in the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. So the brother with the glasses. Yeah, yeah. So he was a he was a bad guy in um, Never Say Never Again. The James Bond with Sean Connery. Ah, the unofficial quote, unofficial. Yeah. So there's a moment I really like, and it's one of those throwaway moments that's so fun because he's trying to disconnect. I think it was that movie. Yeah. Power of things, and then his brother just comes to chainsaw through them, uh-huh. and he's not waiting. He's like, wait, wait, and the guy's just like, nope chains on through and he's like Ma! and he has to do it really fast brothers brothers uh-huh so i would say those are my top three yeah i mean and we're not counting hans gruber no no, just no he, yeah he's not counted okay so what i realize so i realize that one of the guys lives one of who? the minions lives the guy who i'd never seen before but there's like some dude who's like holding a bunch of bags and he gets knocked out from behind before bruce willis comes in Oh, so he just like wakes up and shuffles away, like what? Oh God, terrorist! Yeah, there's like what? some, du- yeah, there's some dude who's just so he one one dude lives. Oh, good for um, him. Yeah, and so I would. So he's the guy who is the terrorist in your yeah. in your world. Yeah, and I'm so so my list is very similar to yours, but I'm going to add in mm-hmm. um, Huey Lewis. Okay, pseudo Huey Lewis. I love that. Who's the fun. door? Who plays the door? The the doorman. It, it, I I think it was it, in the story. It's a fun twist that you've got. You've got you see all these like you, you think international terrorists and there's just some like some dude from One Texas American dude who's yeah. who's like wearing what, cowboy boots. What's and, up, officer? Yeah, hey, nothing here. Just gonna watch basketball. If you want me to describe it to you later, this is a Navy just movie, so I'll do it. Um, so how many um, diehards? Do how you... many ho ho hos? <laughs> <laughs> how many yippee kaye? Oh. How many yippee kayak mother buckets do you give <laughs> diehard? <laughs> So I think we we said on on uh, RoboCop that you you've got to reserve like the ten for like the the ceiling like the top ones and this is a ten for me. I agree. I'm also gonna say it's a ten. Uh, I think this is. We've done too many good movies. I apologize, we to, audience. We have to go back to doing we, the terrible ones. We will the next episode. We'll we will rewatch Runaway. And give it a ten. I'm and not give, sure. You were right. I'm not following you. We'll say it's even There's more better. to talk, I'm sure, about it. <laughs> yeah, I think we should do that thing that, that some people do where you just watch the same movie and podcast <laughs> about it every week. Maybe the next episode we should just play the whole movie and just 
talk about it as we go. Okay, you're joking, Nathan, but I would like to do that, please. Oh, my goodness. I would like to do that. Just for Runaway? Uh-huh. <laughs> Maybe Mannequin. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or, or any movie that has a mannequin, because right. as you know, as long do, as do a Patreon a level to where it's just that <laughs> over and over. It's like, well, that's weird. No one's given it this level yet. Yeah. <laughs> or they can just call me and we'll talk about Runaway mm-hmm. and how much I love it. Um, oh, but so what is your... That was the fastest we've ever rated anything. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's no debate. We're just like, yeah, perfect time. Uh-huh. Yep. Um, this is our, yeah, top-notch action movie. Uh, so you mentioned your deep cut recommendation. Yeah. So The Hunt for Red October. If if you dug the uh, the yeah, this movie, I feel like... Um, uh, John McTiernan. Um, there's a lot of similar sensibilities in the Hunt for October. It's again kind of like another great kind of like clockwork style movie. Great ensemble. And then if you if you dug like the visual aspects of that storytelling, he's using a lot of his same uh, stuff in Hunt for October. Okay, good recommendation. As usual. <laughs> Similarly for me, I could not decide on anything, uh-huh. so I have like. So I can't. I recommended Brooklyn Nine Nine in the last episode. I do recommend it for this, but I already did it. So I wanted to recommend something that um, felt similar, and I thought Speed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I wanted to recommend something with Alan Rickman, and I couldn't decide between Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, <laughs> where he's a, also a great bad guy. Mm-hmm. But in in a way more absurd mm-hmm. way, or Galaxy Quest. Oh yeah, where he's not a bad guy, but he's so good. He's so good. Galaxy Quest is just, I just love it. Yeah. Um, and then something with Bruce Willis. Death becomes her. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's that's a that's a classic that I haven't seen in a while but I have a feeling like it still holds up. Yeah, it's still really funny and fun yeah. to watch. We haven't even talked about the Ode to Joy by Beethoven as seen in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yes. Which is kind of the theme. It's like the big, like, quote-unquote Christmas theme. That mm-hmm. they and I realized that the, that the the villain theme, like the, the ominous music we hear at the beginning of the movie, is a slowed-down version of that. Like oh. they're using the... Like when they're first rolling. Oh my god, in. you're right. I, I know. Didn't ever put that together. Yeah, and they must have really figured it out because Hans Gruber hums it in the elevator at some point, doesn't he? Yeah, I think you're right. Wow, they figured that out. Good catch. Yeah, I think yeah, they completely I, got it. I recommend um, this one, guys. I recommend it too. You should watch this. It's so good. Um, oh, I'm actually going to see a diehard movie party, holiday movie party at Alamo Draft House later uh-huh. this month, and I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, that's great. It's going to be fun. I don't know what the props are going to be, but I, I really hope that they're fun. Uh, it's tape, so you can tape a gun to your back. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> also, one of the bad guys is just wearing a red sweater, and for some reason that made me feel something, I was like, oh, red sweater guy. Okay. <laughs> Um. All right. So, <laughs> thanks for listening. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, we have a review to read. Um. Yeah. Before we like wrap up, of course, you can uh, find everything for most excellent podcast. Uh, in our next episode, we're watching. I think we're doing the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're doing the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. And so next up, we're watching the thing, which is was going to be my Christmas movie suggestion. Everyone's like, it's not a Christmas movie. I'm like, well, there's snow. <laughs> There's a significant amount of snow. Mm-hmm. So that's our wintertime movie. It'll be in, in January. Yep. And we're going to um, have two guests. Yeah. Are we? Is that, yeah. Are we in mm-hmm. for that? Mm-hmm. I get to use all four of my microphones? Yes. How exciting. <laughs> right. It's um, a Christmas miracle. It's going to be a fun episode. You definitely want to listen to that one. But we have a review to read. Um, so this is a part where we always say, hey, like, go online, give us a rating, give us a review. It helps us. Like, we need it. Yeah, go the, do it. The more reviews and ratings, you know, ideally positive, <laughs> that people see, uh, the more legitimacy it gives the podcast, and it actually helps the algorithm. People discover 
the podcast. Um, yeah, it helps, and we we really appreciate it. And like we say, it, as thanks or as a punishment, we'll read them on air. Yes. And so this is the one that we keep forgetting to read, uh, which is a five-star review from five months ago, so I'm sorry. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Ah, the 80s and its wacky movies. This is my era, and these are my movies. Christy and her cadre of co-hosts make this walk down memory lane loads of fun. Recommended from Alice Baker. Thanks, Alice Baker. Whoever you are. <laughs> um, yeah, but please. She's a friend of ours. She is, she is a podcasting friend of ours, yes. Hop on. Give us a review. Give us a rating. Give us a thumbs up. Tell, tell a friend. Tell everyone to listen to the runway episode. <laughs> uh, you can find uh, me at National Comedy Theater The Place and National Comedy Theater The Social Media and NCT Phoenix. And uh, NCT Phoenix, the website, which is nctphoenix.com. All my plugs are online because I live online like Tron. And yes. so at squishystudios.com, um, I'm doing a monthly blog right now, like a filmmaker blog, if you want to check that out. Ooh. Great. Now that I put it on a podcast, I really am going to have to do it every month. Yes, you um, are. And, uh, and then we're also on the Facebooks, the YouTubes, and the Twitters. And also, like, I briefly referenced, and I think I should explain, that, and everybody should go watch your short film, uh, Logan Must Make Star Wars, <laughs> where the premise is that Logan accident, your brother Logan, who has been a guest, uh, accidentally kills George Lucas and then has to make Star Wars. Yeah, from memory and I, in the I, 70s. And I made a, a w- weird reference to that at some point in this podcast, and I just mm-hmm. wanted to mention it before we went away. All right. Um, are we going to do Yippie Kayak Mother Buckets? Yeah. Why don't you just do that? Okay. Okay. You don't want to say it. Uh, <laughs> uh, as always, thank you so much for listening. And uh, do keep the most excellent podcast motto in mind. Be excellent to each other. And yippee kayak, mother buckets. <laughs>